Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Nicola Galli will defend the academic thesis entitled Patent Aggregation, Innovation and EU Competition Law. I welcome everyone present here in the Ola or watching this ceremony online. Very good to have you all. Dear candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. I esteem prorector, I esteem members of the Corona, dear supervisors, family and friends, good morning. It is uh, with great honor that I present you my doctoral thesis titled Patent Aggregation, Innovation and EU Competition Law. As you might recall, my research took place within the APN Innovation Society project under the supervision of Professor Drexel from the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition in Munich, Professor Pugac from Maastricht University, and uh, Dr. Conde Gallego, always from the MPI. So in this presentation, I will first set the scene with the background of the research topic and the methodology. Then I will go to the heart of the matter with uh, uh, mentioning some of the main research findings. So let's start with the background uh, of the topics. Innovation and open innovation are key concepts in my thesis. On the one hand, the term innovation identifies both the multitude of innovation outcomes and the process of activities uh, leading to an innovation. So despite innovation outcomes, uh, such as new products or processes are often uh, patented in uh, inventions, uh, wait, uh, it changes. Uh, uh, are often patented inventions, uh, the expected association between uh, patents and innovation is misleading uh, as it treats uh, innovation as a one-off event. Only the inventions uh, that benefit the public are innovation, uh, whether patented or not. So on the other hand, uh, as first framed by Chesbro, open innovation means that innovation processes go beyond the individual firm's boundaries uh, and involve many actors. So accordingly, firms, uh, accordingly, firms uh, interact and build upon each other's knowledge, uh, and uh, over the past uh, 40 years or so, open innovation displays the closed older innovation paradigm, where firms did not share knowledge and pursue parallel R&D without contact points. In the closed innovation world, the only way firms had to market their innovations was vertical integration into production. In contrast, in the open innovation world, inventors can specialize in what they do best, that is research, while outsourcing to other specialists uh, the other stages of innovation processes. So these being general concepts, uh, innovation features are industry specific. And uh, those of the information and communication technology sector are particularly conducive uh, to patent aggregation. First of all, ICT products are complex, coupling more technologies at once, in contrast, for example, to drugs, which are said to be discrete products. Second, ICT technologies uh, are converging across many previously unrelated fields. Uh, consider the advent of the IoT, in the Internet of Things, whereby everything connects to anything, implying data processing and telecommunication capabilities once exclusively implemented uh, in a handful of devices such as uh, computers uh, or mobile phones. Third, ICT technologies rely on interoperability between uh, different products, uh, which is best ensured by industry standardization. So since the 1990s, ICT companies have contributed their technologies to collective standardization to ensure interoperability among uh, next generation products. Last, ICT innovation is fast paced and the resulting products likely become obsolete earlier than the expiry of any applicable patents, which accumulate in thickets to be act through by manufacturers. So against this background, what is this patent aggregation all about? Well, imagine many ICT firms aggregate patents not to implement the underlying technology into products, but to monetize their exclusive rights otherwise. All these monetization activities fall within the patent aggregation phenomenon that I researched. And the main problem of patent aggregation is its uncertain impact on innovation. It is unclear whether patent aggregation contributes to the virtuous innovation cycle, where inventors give access to their proprietary technologies to implementers, which in turn reward the inventors, 
or instead uh, whether patent aggregation exacerbates uh, issues of vicious innovation cycles, uh, such as patent hold up, namely inventors foreclosing access or imposing anti-competitive terms to implementers, uh, and patent hold out, namely implementers free riding on inventors' proprietary technologies. So my research uh, uh, investigated what role patent aggregation has for innovation and whether EU competition law can remedy any anti-innovative patent aggregation instances. To clarify the relationship between patent aggregation, innovation, and competition law, I raised several types of research questions, matching different research objectives and methodologies. So first, I redefined the unclear concept of uh, patent aggregation and classified its underlying activities. Second, I looked for empirical evidence of uh, patent aggregation activities in Europe. Third, I assessed the relationship between different patent aggregation practices and innovation. Fourth, assuming that patent aggregation could, in specific circumstances, harm innovation, I analyzed whether EU competition law could remedy such anti-innovative uh, uh, patent aggregation instances. And last, based on the previous findings, I highlighted proactive policies to keep patent aggregation and innovation in a positive uh, relationship. So to reach this objective, uh, I employed a mixed method methodology, and as a lawyer, I uh, first used traditional doctrinal legal research to circumscribe the phenomenon uh, and assess its legal implications. Then empirical legal research helped me to explore the occurrence of patent aggregation in Europe. And indeed, delving into the substance of uh, the topic, uh, I realized that the underlying practices uh, lacked uh, transparency. And even a modest uh, empirical contribution up my street could have enhanced uh, the scholarship debate. So, Actually, my empirical endeavor is also internally mixed, since I use uh, quantitative and qualitative methods. On the quantitative side, I mainly exploit two secondary data sources. The MPI patent transfer dataset allows me to observe which European patents are transferred and who are their sellers and buyers. Then through DARS IP, a commercial uh, uh, database of IP litigation, I identified patent aggregators' uh, lawsuits in the in EU jurisdictions. On the qualitative side, I developed case studies of uh, patent aggregators, uh, which allow me to explore otherwise opaque uh, licensing practices. Last, for the competition law part, I use conventional law and economics tools to define markets, assess theories of harm, appraise efficiency justification, and so on. Based on prior scholarship and with a competition law aim, I redefine patent aggregation as any activity where ICT patents, applications, or their commercialization rights are aggregated under common ownership or control and are then used for no manufacturing purposes. So conceived, patent aggregation comprises both the means of aggregating patents, namely prosecution in licenses, acquisitions, and mergers and acquisitions, and on the other hand, the four non-manufacturing non monetization options, which are sales, uh, out licenses, enforcement, and defensive holding. As this slide exemplifies, I also classified patent aggregators uh, uh, depending on their business models, and the bottom line being that patent aggregators are more than just trolls, patent trolls. Both vertically integrated patentees, so-called uh, practicing entities, uh, and Patent patentees operating only upstream, so-called non-practicing entities, engage in patent aggregation activities. However, such business model classification has not proved helpful for competition law, which is business model neutral. The way an undertaking seeks profitability does not change the anti-competitiveness or legality of its conduct, despite informing, of course, the competitive analysis from an industrial organization point of view. Following the redefinition and taxonomy, different chapters uh, assessed uh, various uh, patent aggregation activities uh, from an empirical stance. In a nutshell, the data show patent aggregations are catching on in Europe, and there is no reason to believe uh, such a trend uh, will stop soon.
For instance, the database on uh, European patent transfers by Harof and Gassler shows that vertically integrated corporations are the major suppliers of patents uh, to patent assertion entities, which cast doubts on the role of these entities as champions of uh, small inventors against large infringers. On the qualitative side, I did a case study of the licensing activity of uh, CISVEL, France Brevet, Fractus, and Qualcomm, and the results are pretty topical. A uh, hot issue in the standardization sphere is whether dominant firms abuse their position by licensing their uh, standard essential patents only at the end of value chain while refusing access uh, uh, while refusing sorry, licenses uh, to component manufacturers. So the debate around the issue is often framed as access to all or ATA, meaning licenses only to end product manufacturers versus uh, license to all or LTA, meaning licenses uh, to any willing licensee. Well, the case study shows that some patent aggregators already employ a middle way between ATA and LTA. Indeed, Sisvel and Fractus licensed to any willing licensee, yet they charge for the entire field of use specific value of the licensed rights. So such a practice goes to the core problem of sharing rents between SCP holders and implementers. Coming to the hardness nest of identifying the effects of patent aggregations on innovation and dynamic competition, in a nutshell, I argue that to have a complete picture of the pro or anti-innovativeness of any patent aggregation instance, one should look at the, at least a six diets of balancing positive and negative innovation effects. So building upon my research stay at Danemar ERP Consulting, I applied the analytical framework of uh, these six diets of innovation effects to every patent aggregation combination. And regarding the theoretical uh, aggregate impact of the practices, for example, the defensive holding of patents stands out uh, as the only patent aggregation combination with a negative innovation impact. So in this sense, the competition law analysis of a patent aggregation case needs to consider every effect of each diet because patent aggregation has a circumstance dependent impact on innovation. Uh, lastly, results concern uh, whether competition law provides appropriate remedies uh, for addressing the adverse effects of patent aggregation. And uh, starting uh, with the applicability of Article 101 of the Treaty to Multilateral Patent Aggregation Activities, the findings are, are threefold. So first, evidentiary problems dissuade competition authorities uh, from investigating patent aggregators' coordinated uh, uh, prosecution and defensive holding efforts. Second, the technology transfer block exemption regulation and related guidelines apply to aggregators' uh, bilateral licenses and settlements uh, with a more lenient treatment of uh, MPs than practicing entities due to their fewer horizontal uh, competitive issues. Finally, Article 101 enforcement almost ignore the vertical foreclosure risk of patent privateering arrangements and joint patent acquisition by consortia and defensive patent funds. Turning to Article 102 of the treaty, I advocate that the precedence on abusive patent acquisitions, refusals to license, litigation, and prosecution cannot do much uh, against patent aggregation. So such cases firmly relate to foreclosure on downstream patent implemented product markets, which is not patent aggregators' cup of tea. Especially MPEs, other than privateers, have fewer incentives than dominant practicing entities to exclude or discriminate access to their patented technologies, since ultimately effective downstream product market competition maximize their upstream licensing earnings. So in contrast, practicing entities can leverage foreclosure or discrimination between either markets where they operate. Moreover, the jurisprudence at issue fits discrete products and close innovation ecosystem from far from ICT settings. So acknowledging that patent aggregation is at the core patent-based rent seeking, I found that Article 102's best shot against anti-innovative patent aggregation concern abusive enforcement uh, of standard essential patents uh, and exploitative or discriminatory licensing. Though in practice, uh, the absence of a straightforward legal test for abusive licensing, uh, exploitation, or discriminations cautions against uh, enforcement errors and strategic use of competition law complaints to hold out from taking a license. So let me conclude with three takeaways from the entire thesis. So first, 
patent aggregation is more than just lousy patent trolls and good patent pools. It comprises the means to build patent portfolios uh, and their non-manufacturing exploitation options by both non-practicing entities and practicing entities. Second, patent aggregation is already in Europe uh, and will spread even more due to the importance of ICT technologies uh, for digitalization. And third and last, uh, absent patent law revolutions to eradicate ICT pat patent thickets, uh, competition law oversight is a second best yet highly desirable remedy against anti-innovative patent aggregation instances. Thank you for listening. I give the floor back to the I highly esteemed uh, prorector. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Kamperman Sanders. Professor Kamperman Sanders is Professor of Intellectual Property Law at our university, and he's also the chair of the assessment committee. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, dear Niccolo, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on your impressive work. It's a robust, multidisciplinary work of scholarship that will have an impact on how producing entities, non-producing entities, I should say, and other patent aggregators are perceived. It reads like a restoration of the reputation of oft maligned aggregators and patent enforcement entities. And you succeed at convincing me that these parties can bring positive competitive effects if patent trolls are kept in check. But is this part of the patent bargain? The hefty tomb before me expresses your struggle to find alignment between proprietary interest of the patentee and the attempts of competition authorities to keep those in check. I think you correctly state that defining patent assertion entities as trolls is not helpful, as much as it is difficult also to define what good patent pools are that bring about efficiencies in licensing and technology transfer. But at least you point to the undesirable effects of patent thickets, especially in the ICT sector, where patent assertion is lawful in principle and competition law, you've said it yourself, is no silver bullet to address anti-competitive aggregation or exploitation. Your quest for alignment between patent and competition law is most clearly expressed in Proposition 6. There, you feel a fundamental change to the patent system is in order, as antitrust oversight is second best, as you state. You, will, however, remain elusive on what system change is necessary. It sounds fundamental, but what do you really mean? At several instances in your thesis, you describe the way in which the reading and application of the enforcement directive, IPRED, calls for effectiveness and dissuasiveness of enforcement measures, but remedies should also be proportional. Proportionality being the operative notion to allow for aggregators' demands to be weighed against third party and societal interests, very much like reading Article 7 of the TRIPS Agreement. The protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights should contribute to the promotion of technological in innovation and the transfer and dissemination of technology to the mutual advantage of producers and users of technological knowledge and in a manner conducive to societal and economic welfare and to a balance of rights and obligations. That's the quote of Article 7. Reading this, and given your persuasive need for proportionality throughout the legal order, as also expressed in the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights, isn't the principle of proportionality of a different order as compared to effectiveness and dissuasiveness. In footnote 469, you also refer to a study on ex-post evaluation ex and the ex-ante impact of IPRED. But is this enough in terms of systemic robustness and change, given uh, the need for ex-post corrections by competition authorities of the way in which patent assertion entities operate. You seem not to think so and spend many pages explaining the limits to the application of, applica uh, of competition law in respect of propriety rights in patents for invention. Hence the need, you say, for fundamental change. But doesn't the 
key to all these questions lie in the patent bargain as expressed in the English Statute of Monopolies of 1623, which, oddly enough, you do not mention in all your 600 pages. In that statute, um, it repeals past and future monopolies and all letters patents. They are declared contrary to law, but preserve a few exceptions to free market competition, one of these being patents for invention. For novel inventions to be granted for a period of 15 years to the true and first inventor, perhaps not to patent aggregators, but only for as far as they are not contrary to the law, mischievous to the state by raising prices of commodities at home or hurt of trade or generally inconvenient. A quote from 1623. The statute of monopolies seems not only to provide the bedrock of a modern competitive economy, but also of modern patent law. So isn't the alignment of that you seek, wasn't that always there? Should your 600 pages not either have started or ended with those elegant considerations from 1623? I look forward to hearing your reply. Hey, esteemed opponent, uh, uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, indeed, it gives me the possibility to uh, expand a bit on the uh, patent law uh, consideration in, in the thesis and the relationship uh, with, uh, with, the comp with the competition law intervention. So um, probably uh, I could have even started uh, also given my hometown Florence with the Badalone, Badalone patent to Brunelleschi 200 years before and uh, with the Venice uh, uh, patent uh, statute uh, of uh, a few years later on. Uh, this is at least what I do when I teach patent law. I start from there. Um, but no, of course, I mean, the, 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 the core issue of, uh, of the entire thesis uh, and of the tension uh, between uh, exclusivity granted by patents uh, and uh, uh, access uh, spurred by uh, competition law is uh, inherent in the patent bargain and uh, has always been there, it's nothing new. Uh, let's say the, what, is, uh, what is new novel and uh, what changes uh, in the ICT field, I, I find, is the uh, amount of patents uh, and the amount of applications that ICT technologies uh, find. So um, patentees uh, do not know who are their infringers. Uh, infringers do not know who are their uh, uh, prospective uh, licensors. So there is a, a problem of mismatch between, uh, uh, let's say, offer, supply of uh, uh, proprietary technology and uh, uh, demand for, for such technology. So in the thesis, I uh, try to highlight that the intervention of uh, uh, competition law and overcoming, let's say, the, the exclusivity uh, um, side effects of, of, of patent law should only come in uh, in exceptional circumstances when there is a, uh, when patent law not only prevents uh, static uh, imitation competition, which is what it should do, but when it also prevents dynamic competition from uh, outside the market uh, uh, players. So I find that only in this uh, short circuit between uh, patents and dynamic competition that it's, that's the place for, for competition law intervention. And uh, uh, of course, there, there could be many, um, many policies uh, on the patent law sides that could uh, uh, make uh, our patent law system better. Uh, we often uh, talk and discuss about raising the uh, patent bar, raising the patent bar, raising quality of patents. And uh, of course, this is a, a, a very complex issue. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, patent offices uh, are really um, dependent, let's say, they, they, they somehow uh, allow me this. Uh, the patentees, the patent applicants are somehow the clients of patent offices, and so there is an interest on having more patents granted, also because patents uh, uh, provide for tax revenue to, to governments. So, so 
I also don't see uh, an effective way to uh, stop, let's say, the patent flood and uh, eradicate patent thickets uh, uh, completely uh, within the patent law systems. Of course, rate, keeping patents of high quality as the uh, European Patent Office uh, has been uh, uh, doing uh, uh, in the past uh, in general is something that is the, in the public interest. So if only patents of uh, uh, high quality in terms of the patentability thresholds are granted, we should not have any, uh, we should have uh, fewer uh, patent aggregation problems. So, but Thank I do see so this much. coming. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Michael Kort. Professor yeah, Kort thing. is professor of, of professor of private law, uh, economic law, IP law, and labor law at the University of Augsburg. And it gives me great pleasure that he is here with us today for this very special defense, which is in fact a joint degree with the University of Augsburg. So very much welcome to Maastricht University. You have thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be here. And thank you, Mr. Galli, for your excellent uh, thesis as well as his excellent uh, speech which you gave. Um, however, my first question, I have two questions, is already in a certain respect answered. It was a broad question uh, in which respect patent aggregation may be a violation of Article 102 TFEU. But I will precise or alter it a little bit now. Um, as the title of your uh, thesis is Patent Aggregation Innovation and EU Competition Law, which role may this innovative aspect play for possible justification of Article 102, uh, uh, that, that there is no uh, violation of Article 102 TFEU, maybe in the respect, as we all know, the uh, European Court does not apply strictly at least not the rule of reason, but may this or the aspect of more economic approach play any role considering the question, uh, concerning the question whether patent aggregation may be a violation of 102 TFEU. This is my first question, and the second question is just which role does the AstraZeneca case play uh, uh, in, within the considerations of your thesis? I listed my opponent. Uh, thank you very much for, for the question. So um, regarding the, the role uh, of innovation uh, in uh, Article 102 also with regard to patent aggregation, um, of course, uh, the, the only way that it can, can come uh, in, uh, in perspective and in the competition law assessment is with the more economic approach. So it's, uh, uh, it's fundamental uh, in, uh, within the within the framework of the uh, more economic approach that we can uh, either uh, uh, completely exclude the uh, illegality of a patent aggregation practice or instead justify it because of uh, innovation uh, justifications. Uh, I must say also to expand a bit uh, beyond the presentation that uh, I, I find that like a quite important role for innovation consideration vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, patent aggregation practices can be played in the uh, in under merger control under the EU merger regulation and there there is really the possibility of uh, intervening uh, um, ex ante so before the uh, a concentration is uh, uh, is completed to keep uh, uh, innovation incentives uh, in the market and so, uh, I mean, I, uh, I finished the thesis before um, uh, some important developments in the, in the field of, of, of merger law. And the way now, I, I was writing uh, that uh, the, the way that Germany and Austria uh, had in introduced uh, alternative uh, uh, merger thresholds in terms of uh, transaction value was something valuable. And so this way for capturing a, a concentration that have a, a very important impact on uh, for, for innovation incentives uh, and, cap and capability of firms. So actually the developments of the, of the enforcement in this field uh, have, uh, go have gone in, the, in this direction of uh, reviewing uh, even a smaller concentrations, uh, uh, thanks to also to Article 22 of the uh, merger regulation that allow referrals from uh, um, national, uh, from member states to the commission so 
innovation is a, is a really uh, coming into the uh, competition law picture, picture and uh, the, the awareness uh, of uh, of its value for for society has has grown uh, in in the enforcement practice and uh, may, may i ask you to uh, repeat the second question it was just a question what role the AstraZeneca ah, case yeah. plays uh, 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 concerning your, the considerations sure. of your thesis. Ali Simnopone, thank you very much for the uh, repetition. No, uh, of course, AstraZeneca uh, and, and uh, on uh, misleading information before patent offices uh, uh, was a. Uh, uh, was one of the cases that was a natural uh, subject uh, of, my, of my analysis because of the uh, close relationship uh, of, uh, uh, of patents and, and competition law circumstances. But as, uh, as I mentioned, as for the other uh, Article 102 exclusionary uh, precedents, uh, the value I find is, uh, uh, is somehow limited because the really the core is, uh, of, of such a case is uh, uh, foreclosure on uh, patent implementing markets uh, of generic manufacturers in, in that case. So I don't see uh, a, a big uh, like guiding uh, value for, for patent regulation practices. Thank you. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Van Zimmeren, who is Professor of Intellectual Property Law and Governance at the University of Antwerp, and who is also a member of the Assessment Committee. I would like to welcome her also very much to Maastricht University today. Thank you for the kind welcome. Um, so dear candidate, dear Nicolo, uh, congratulations first and foremost uh, with uh, a very good work and a beautiful book. I think also the layout, uh, you uh, deserve some congratulations for that. Uh, very systematic research also, the way that you have done that, also your mixed method approach and the way that you justify using that approach I think is, is very valuable and very well done. Um, to my taste, your conclusions and recommendations could have been a little bit more specific and your takeaways today also I think are a little bit generic. Um, and so with my questions, I want to uh, try to take you a little bit out of your comfort zone, uh, which is the electrical engineering, the focus on electrical engineering, because you go quite far in even defining patent aggregation, linking it only to electrical engineering. And you know my background, so maybe you already expected this question. So um, even though I, I don't want to argue with you in terms of the fact that it makes sense to focus on electrical uh, engineering uh, for patent aggregation and that the problems are actually most prominent in that area, you make some statements related to medicines as discrete products. And I think it's maybe not sufficiently nuanced because also the pharma uh, and biotech sector, there's more and more open innovation, and we don't really look at this sector as only uh, resulting in these kind of discrete products. So I would like to invite you to explore a little bit more this other sector and to um, give us some lessons, recommendations, specifically also for patent aggregation in that field, thinking also about things like personalized medicine or also platform technologies in this sector like CRISPR, because there, there may be bigger risks than what you have pointed to in terms of the discrete products as you refer to. I listened to the point and thank you very much for uh, the question. And uh, indeed it is something that uh, deserves uh, further research. Uh, uh, I, I I couldn't uh, I couldn't include also pharma consideration in a, an already too long uh, book. So I believe uh, they deserve uh, uh, an appropriate uh, uh, time and research to be uh, uh, explored. But definitely the um, practices at issue where patents are aggregated and not really um, implemented into products so kept, uh, let's say, away from the markets but used otherwise uh, are, uh, can, can be and are widespread also in the pharmaceutical sector. I, in this sense, I, I also um, think that the way now that the, the world is uh, uh, gearing towards digitalization uh, whereby really uh, artificial intelligence applications are applied uh, in, uh, in, in any sector and uh, uh, manufacturing uh, 4.0 um, 
it's uh, it's really uh, changing the way uh, traditional let's say sectors such as pharma have worked uh, and uh, also there the importance of uh, technologies uh, is uh, is crossing uh, a strict uh, a sector borders so i'm sure that we we can uh, we can uh, uh, have uh, pentate aggregation applications and uh, insights also for the pharma sector um they 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 deserve uh, for the research uh, and um, perhaps uh, I, I, at the beginning of the research, I encountered also some uh, uh, patent aggregators in the pharma sector, su such as the UN-based, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, medicine patent pool, which have uh, uh, a more, let's say, um, uh, charity approach, so giving access to uh, valuable medicines also to uh, developing countries. So they were of a different kind though. They were efforts to, uh, to let medicines uh, available, uh, to give access to medicines to, uh, to developing countries. So not really monetization of these patents, but more for a, a beneficial approach. Uh, also other sectors are worth of uh, further scrutiny. For example, the energy sector has also, I've seen some initiatives uh, to aggregate patents uh, and, uh, and monetize them. So, uh, I'm uh, glad to hear that I have uh, further work to do in the <laughs> coming next. I have time for another question. Okay, so thank you for being concise in your answer so I can uh, um, offer you another challenging uh, question. So on page 124, you uh, propose or you argue that there's need for more transparency on uh, patent ownership, and I agree with that, but I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on that. So what does that mean, and how can we have more transparency? And maybe in your answer, you can also briefly link this to the recently leaked document of the European Commission on Standard Essential Patents, because there's also uh, some attention there in terms of transparency. So maybe the solution offered in that document could also be something that you uh, want to refer to. I esteemed the opponent. Thank you very much for the uh, follow-on question. Yeah, um, to me, uh, transparency is something really important in the property uh, aspect of uh, patent law. And uh, if you want patents to uh, fulfill their function, uh, we should uh, uh, know their boundaries, uh, who their uh, owners are, so that we can all know the limits of, of the system. Uh, and in theory, there are, uh, of course, registers, uh, official registers before the patent offices, uh, including the European Patent Office. But these are really not... Uh, uh, not really well kept, uh, let's say. So both uh, both the owners of patents uh, uh, have, um, let's say, are not so diligent in uh, updating the information uh, on the on the registries. Uh, also, because there are no uh, there are no meaningful, uh, let's say, sanctions for not doing so. And uh, this was uh, one of the issues uh, that I also found in the empirical uh, part of the the thesis, uh, where I used. Uh, the only available uh, data set on patent transferred uh, uh, by Professor Adolf uh, and Dr. Gasle from the Max Planck Institute, uh, because they were capable of uh, uh, um, gathering data on European patents validated in Germany, because Germany is the only country that actually is uh, careful of uh, uh, registering, uh, let's say, um, ownership transfers of, uh, for, for the patents. So this is a really hot issue. <laughs> The opposition will now be continued by Professor Picht, who is Professor of Commercial Competition and Intellectual Property Law at the University of Zurich, and who is also a member of the Assessment Committee. And Professor Picht is joining us online for this ceremony, and I welcome him also very much to Maastricht University today. Very good to have you with us. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Apologies uh, and the with you only online. I, I do hope the connection is good enough. Um, thank you for the good read, Nicolo. Uh, I, I enjoyed reading and uh, assessing your thesis. I would like to drive on a little bit the topic of merger control with my first question, a topic that we already touched upon briefly today. Um, I understand from your thesis that you do attach much importance and positive potential to merger control in that field. At the same time, I also found your, your concrete proposals on, on how to 
uh, instrumentalize merger control uh, regarding patent aggregators, a little bit generic. And you said yourself that um, the law has moved on beyond the state of affairs uh, reflected in your thesis. Especially we have the, uh, as it were, Illumina Grail development, the possibility for the EU Commission to uh, accept merger control cases under 22 merger control regulation, even though they meet neither the EU merger control thresholds nor the member state thresholds. And uh, as of as of quite recently, we have the tower cast decision, which weighs in in favor of the application of 102 TFEU on mergers, which could again for the non meeting of the merger control thresholds not be reviewed under the merger control regulation, but but uh, can now more easily be reviewed under 102 TFEU ex post. So my first question would be, which patent aggregation, let's limit it to JV merger transactions should be reviewed under these new tools? What should typical remedies be if we see concerns under the SIG test? And how would such an extended merger control regime impact the need to apply 101, 102 TFEU? If you should have time after that first question, my second question would be, we all know, I guess, the, the um, new SEP regulation by the EU Commission, which is so widely leaked that it is it has factually become public. I don't know whether you saw the text, it's not so important. You may have at least grasped from you know, secondhand communications that there is a procedure envisaged by which the overall cumulative royalty for a given standard would be determined. Proceedings are rather complex and of all places, the EU IPO um, is, is the center of competence for that. Now, assuming that this works out and that for a given standard or family of standards, uh, such a cumulative royalty could be determined, um, what would that possibility do with the need to employ competition law, I mean, traditional competition law to uh, the, the licensing activities of PAEs? Those would be my questions. I'll esteem the opponent, thank you very much for the questions. So uh, indeed, uh, I, uh, you are absolutely, absolutely right that the world has uh, developed a lot in the last uh, uh, two years, uh, the merger control uh, enforcement with uh, the communication on Article 22 of the merger regulation and the subsequent uh, Illumina Grail uh, prohibition. And uh, now in the, uh, in the past weeks with the tower cast judgment on Article 102. So uh, let's say that the the time of a big patent portfolio uh, changes of ownership i think uh, so far let's say as uh, as passed so these big patent portfolios uh, for example big divestiture from uh, by nokia to many patent aggregators uh, or by ericsson have already let's say gone so the these big companies especially in europe uh, have already let's say uh, trim their portfolios and so the chance of uh, uh, reviewing these transactions uh, and let's say undo them under article 102 uh, mm, would be uh, highly problematic i mean these uh, uh, the, the patents also lapse over time and so there's not really a possibility to undo a, a concentration uh, that is already uh, 10 years old let's say but in terms of remedies, if uh, if a patent portfolio uh, changes hands uh, and uh, it poses uh, problems for uh, dynamic competition or uh, product market competition, uh, I would I would see of course uh, uh, licensing obligations uh, uh, 
front licensing obligation as the most uh, uh, suitable remedy and uh, uh, yeah uh, accompanied by pledges uh, to open licensing uh, this would be probably the the most uh, straightforward uh, remedy in case a uh, uh, concentration involving patent portfolio poses uh, uh, competitive problems um, and uh, on the on the second, uh, on, the, on the SCP regulation, uh, I, I've, I've seen the document. Uh, uh, I, I still doubt that this is going to be the uh, published proposal. It has, uh, I, I really think it poses uh, uh, many competition law issues uh, within the text, not even involving the, the companies uh, in the processes before the UIPO. But I really think that this is what something that uh, DG Grow has done without uh, consulting DG Comp. Uh, so I, 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 I'm skeptical. Uh, I'm skeptical of seeing it uh, coming out uh, in the way that we've seen it uh, in uh, uh, confidentially, or, or in the leaked version. And uh, the cumulative top-down approach actually could be uh, could pose uh, uh, a competition law problem in, in terms even of, uh, um, let's say, uh, yeah, mm, monopsony perhaps, uh, in terms that uh, there is a really, uh, yeah, collusion uh, on, on the terms, uh, no, no, really monopsony. There, there could be collusion in the way that these, uh, these are, uh, the cumulative royalty for a given standard is, uh, is uh, achieved. And uh, there needs to be many competition law safeguards in this process. Uh, I mean, discussing uh, price issues has always been outside of the standardization field. Uh, all the, uh, the main uh, IPR policies of a standard setting organization make it very clear that the discussion are only technical. So now this uh, addition, uh, especially in terms of uh, determining what the cumulative uh, uh, price of a standard is and how the company should divide it, uh, the, the SCPO owner should divide it among themselves, I see it very problematic. Nevertheless, uh, there is something and also a uh, link with uh, the, the question I couldn't answer by my esteemed opponent, uh, Van Zimmeren, uh, that the, the aspect of transparency that the register would bring uh, as a simple register that uh, uh, list who are the owners of it, of the SCPs, uh, what are the standards uh, that the SCP rely to. This could, could be an added value. So I'm not completely, let's say, uh, against or uh, doubtful on the proposal. There are some uh, uh, advantages in it, the, some good, good points that could, be, that could ameliorate the standardization uh, field. But of course, yeah, the, the competi competition law uh, concerns are, are very high when you put together, let's say, companies and trying to agree on a, a common price. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Philipsen, who is Professor of Shifts in Governance at Erasmus University Rotterdam um, and at Maastricht University. And he is not a member of the assessment committee, um, but it's very good to have him here and to raise a question. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Prorector, dear Ken Mr. Candidate, dear Niccolo. Let me first congratulate you, like the colleagues before me, on a wonderful book. It's thicker than a patent thicket, I would say. Yeah. Um, well, you provide a really detailed overview uh, and analysis of different types of patent aggregators. And then it, it, it clearly shows that this is a heterogeneous group, right? That's one of the core messages from the thesis. Uh, so at the heart of your thesis lies your plea for a case-by-case -case approach. Uh, more specifically, uh, you, you state that a more IP-aware public enforcement approach under every competition law provision uh, would be recommended by you. So of course, that, that makes you vulnerable. You, you, your, your thesis contains many findings and recommendations, and the questions go from mergers to multilateral uh, patent aggregation uh, to 102. And as an economist, I, I of course, I'm, I'm very much uh, in favor usually of, of this case-by-case -case approach and the effects-based approach, but also aware of the risks that you point at, right? It's much more costly, it's less predictable, it's slow if we uh, make this competition law approach even more IP aware, and that in times where there's limited uh, resources for the staff, there's all this talk about uh, the greening which needs to be incorporated, fairness elements in competition law is really a lot. So I originally planned 
to ask you uh, for a more specific recommendation on how to do this considering the limited time and such, but I'm not going to do that because uh, the discussions before me already uh, dealt with uh, some of these topics. So I'm going to ask you also for reasons of time a slightly different uh, concise question, um, which also relates to my uh, background in economics. Because, uh, well, as I said uh, before, you present the patent aggregators as a heterogeneous group. You show that there are positive effects of their activities also on competition. Nevertheless, you repeatedly write uh, a variation of the following phrase, I, I quote from page 517, patent aggregation is at its core patent-based rent-seeking. And that you say a couple of times. Now, I'm, that made me think as an economist, because in law and economics, rent-seeking is not something positive, right? So I, I have looked up two definitions for you, I and mean, you can tell me if this is also how you define rent-seeking, and then if you still <laughs> stay by your uh, statements, right? A general definition that I found just by looking on, on uh, Wikipedia uh, is the fact or practice of manipulating public, manipulating public policy or economic conditions as a strategy for increasing profits, okay? The more economic one that I usually use is something like uh, using resources like time and money, lobbying uh, and such, uh, to generate a wealth transfer to you without creating new wealth, right? Uh, so this is, this is, so you, you basically only generate a redistribution of profits from society to you or from another group to you. Now, I'm still wondering if either of these definitions would be right, it doesn't really match with your more neutral take on patent aggregation, uh, where you say there are several types of it. So my question is very simply put, uh, how did you define rent seeking? Why did you write several times that patent aggregation is at its core patent based rent seeking? That's the question. I look forward to your. <laughs> I'll esteem the opponent. Thank you very much for the question, for the questions actually. So I'll. Uh I'll try to answer both, even if the first one was just, uh, let's say, in the in the background. So the the more IP aware uh, approach they would advocate uh, would involve the transposing uh, the control shares methodologies that the European Commission already employs in uh, uh, reviewing uh, mergers of uh, publishing music publishing uh, uh, houses to the uh, to the sphere of patent aggregators. So this is would be the, yeah, the control shares uh, to somehow transpose it to the uh, patent law world. And also the other uh, more IP aware, uh, um, let's say, change intervention would be to uh, em employ more extensively the patent law analysis of uh, citations of patents uh, uh, that was uh, uh, displayed by the European Commission in two mergers, uh, uh, the Center on Innovation Consideration, which are the Do DuPont uh, merger and the Bayer Monsanto one, in both in the agrochemical sector. So also there, there was a, an analysis of pa based on the patents uh, and the relations between uh, the patents in a portfolio and, and uh, in the industry that uh, to my uh, understanding is uh, uh, could help uh, the um, assessment of patent aggregation cases on the on the rent seeking uh, um, issue that you identified yeah of course uh, uh, there is uh, some um, negative nuance in that uh, but i really meant uh, by rent seeking uh, let's say monetization based on patents uh, just uh, uh, just with the patents without the products so in my view, this would be would not have such a negative connotation uh, insofar as it is uh, justified by a uh, good quality patent behind. So there is nothing wrong in an inventor uh, with a good invention, patented invention, to seek um, profitability on that. I'll accept uh, for now. We, we can discuss this uh, at some time. Yes. No. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, the opposition will now be continued by Professor Van Engelen. Professor Van Engelen is Professor of IP Litigation and Transaction Practice at our university. Uh, thank you, Pro-Rector. Uh, dear candidate, uh, I congratulate you with a very thorough uh, research uh, project. Uh, I was told never to judge a book by its cover. <laughs> In all honesty, that's what I usually do. Um, 
And that created a bit of a problem because apart from being here at the university, I'm also a lawyer in private practice. And a partner of mine at the law firm represents Hasbro, who owns the rights in Monopoly. <laughs> and being a thorough litigator, she immediately said, this is a clear infringement of copyright. <laughs> so I, I ask your support because I marginally succeeded in convincing her, no, this is the original from 1935, and therefore the copyright has expired. So my first question is whether you agree with that. And I don't want to hint to the answer, but I would say yes if I were you, because otherwise the go to jail would be <laughs> applicable here. My second question um, is a bit more that if I understand it correctly, we have patent law as such, and we have EU competition law, or competition law, which is sort of a different domain. What I somewhat struggle with is that I have the impression that you want to solve the negative implications of patent aggregation within patent law itself or outside of competition law, because competition law may not pick it up or may not be sufficiently uh, uh, geared to solve that problem. If we look at it from a property law perspective, patents are property within uh, the meaning of Article 17 of the EU Charter. I struggle with making a distinction or limiting that property right if it would be because, well, if, if you make a comparison with owning real estate or real property, if I own a piece of land, I can enforce my property right and kick everybody out. The fact that I don't live on the land myself does not really impact my property right, doesn't really limit it. And the fact that I own a lot of land also does not impact my uh, property right. So why would that be different if we deal with it as a property right? Would the fact that I don't practice the invention, would the fact that I have a lot of patents, can we actually accommodate that within patent law as opposed to competition law. Um, because if it would, then the second part of the question would be under Article 52 of the EU Charter, limitations of a property right should be provided by law. And that would mean statutory provisions, at least that's one interpretation of it. And then the question is, a statutory provision would probably be like, if you own a lot of patents, <laughs> we limit your right in this particular way, which seems somewhat strange. I listen to the point. I will uh, start uh, from uh, the, the second question uh, and leave uh, the, the one on the litigation uh, for <laughs> for the discussion on the on the monopoly patent. So, yeah, of course, there is already the exception in the law for non-use, like patents that are non-used after a certain time uh, by uh, their owner uh, um, could be uh, there could be a, a license of right uh, uh, asked for, but yeah, this exception is not really effective. Uh, we know that uh, it can be easily circumvented with uh, I don't know an intra-group license uh, uh, for the patent. So this is really it's there. I mean, even for patent law, patents should not exist if they are not used. No, it's not something. Uh, uh, it's not in the patent bargain that we grant patents. Uh, just uh, for letting them on shelves uh, without uh, without use, so I think that there are m there might be already checks in the in the patent system, but they are not really uh, let's say effective. Then there is where in exceptional circumstances that competition law. Uh, chips in and is not against uh, any patentee, for example, uh, under the mm, ab abuse of dominance prohibition that we would see intervention. The threshold is very high, of course. Uh, an invention is a patent, uh, a patented invention does not per se uh, grant uh, dominance in a competition law sense. Uh, so it's not that the intervention would be widespread. But of course, when you, a company uh, has a huge patent portfolio involving uh, patents that are indispensable to practice a standard or a, not a standard, but a very important technology in a sector that is uh, uh, necessary to, to be and to play in the market, then uh, uh, perhaps uh, dominance uh, in the relevant market for the technology exists. And then there is the, uh, the, the limits uh, imposed by competition law. So, um, 
I, I realized also the, what you mentioned, that there shouldn't be, let's say, any uh, discrimination between uh, uh, patentees that practice their own invention. When I myself, uh, I was at the technology transfer office uh, in, in Florence, and I realized for universities, it's very hard to get the money. <laughs> Niccolo Galli, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. I request that you and your company, both here and online, await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the
Niccolò Galli. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Pukac is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I now invite your supervisor to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. So by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer you upon you with the certificate of your PhD. And well done. Please be seated. So, shall I? Shall I stand up? Yes. So um, it's now my pleasure to provide an advance to the thesis and, and uh, to what you have achieved here, Niccolo. Um, for me, it has been a great pleasure to, to be your supervisor, and I'm very happy to take over this part. Let me first say a few words on the thesis. Uh, first, a very important uh, aspect of that thesis, it matters. It's enormously important for future societies. This is not just a pat about patent aggregation. This is not just about standard essential patents. It is about the future digital economy and future digital society. It matters for the whole society. Why? This is not just about electrical engineering. It is about an infrastructure technology that we constantly use. There is no day when we don't use it. Some people, if you get on a metro, I do this every morning, you hardly see a person without a smartphone looking at the screen. Everybody is doing it. We constantly use those technologies. And in the digital sector, we have a big debate and huge activity, especially of the European Union, uh, drafting many, many laws on whom gatekeepers. There is high sensitivity on a couple of firms that have become very dominant or very, very powerful in our society. Nowadays, when we talk about ChatGPT, even more so, right? Even more power will be allocated at the big platform firms. But don't forget the holders of the patents for the infrastructure technologies. They also have a similar position. So that matters enormously for what, how we live in the future and what this actually plays and how important this is. We followed as supervisors the research over many, many years. And at the end, it was very difficult during the pandemic to be very clear. And the, pic the book also pictures the research, right? One may wonder whether this is correct. At the very end, you may think, oh, it could be a much shorter book. Why doesn't this guy simply concentrate on what maybe really matters? Maybe writing a book on the competition law assessment of privateering, because maybe that is a very core uh, issue where we see the problem, where maybe competition law really matters. Concentrate on, on CISWIL and not uh, France Privé and so on. So maybe have more focus. But imagine such a book, 
we would lose a lot. Um, and that was also said during our debate just before, when we discussed whether the degree should be granted or not, which was not really an issue. But, of course, the question was, where does the value lie? And everybody loved the empirical part. Because there is where you actually provide a lot of insight, where you prove that interdisciplinary can be very, very fruitful. The book starts with an open question. Do we have patent aggregation in Europe in the first place? You even mention it in the book. Where should the research go if the answer is negative? Then the design would be a completely different one. There was an open question, and I think that characterizes fundamental research and, and also scholarship. Ask the relevant questions. Uh, there has to be curiosity to, to give the appropriate answers. And this shows that you had to get into the analysis of a, uh, on a lot of empirical studies that were available, but were not really on the point. And, order, and in order to interpret the research, you also had to read it with a lawyer's perspective, right? Also with an institutional understanding of the patent system. Where are the incentives of the established uh, institutions? And the law is an institution that actually may promote patent aggregation. And once you have done this, you have to pinpoint the problem. Right? And only then the application of the law came into the picture. This shows that especially the first parts are wonderful interdisciplinary research, the one we wanted to see, and we got it to see. And, at the, uh, and only then the application of the law starts, where many or most of the legal PhD thesis would start. You had to do a lot of research before that. And I compliment you for having done this, right? Um, and this also shows that you will be able to work in this direction in, in the future. So my sincere congratulations, especially in this regard. And what this also proves is that you are now very well established to, to continue a future career as an academic. And I can also tell to everybody here in the room, that as a supervisor, you also have to ask, what has been your personal impact? What are you most proud of uh, at such a moment? And I tell you what, uh, and, and Beatrice, who is on the screen, she knows about it. We had the same intention. We have to do everything to make this man stay in academia. Because we, at the very beginning, we knew that this man is very promising and he had other offers. And I'm very happy that everything has now been established uh, for this future. So my sincere congratulations to you. Many thanks to people here in the room, uh, especially to our colleagues in Maastricht, who worked a lot on the program as such, also supervising, co-supervising him, uh, also organizing this event today. Many thanks also to the members of the, uh, of the Defense Committee. Thank you very much and sincere congratulations to you. I'm looking forward to partying today. Thank you. <laughs> Dear Dr. Kali, also on behalf of Maastricht University and its Faculty of Law, many congratulations on the degree that you just acquired. I always say it's the highest degree we have available, <laughs> and you just got it. Um, and it's not only the highest degree, um, it also gives me great pleasure that this is a joint degree um, with the University of uh, uh, Augsburg. Um, that also is very important to our university. Uh, this cooperation that we have there within the broader cooperation of the IPIN, wonderful IPIN uh, project. Congratulations to you. Also many congratulations to your family uh, and friends and fiancé present here also on the first row and also uh, joining us here online during this ceremony. Uh, and I of course also congratulate your three uh, supervisors. I was not able uh, to already welcome uh, during this ceremony also Professor 
uh, Drexel. Very good to have you here with us in Maastricht. And also Professor Konde, who is also joining us online for this uh, ceremony. Congratulations also to, uh, uh, to you. There is one more practical remark that I have to make, which is that there will be a reception um, that is offered by the young doctor right here in this building. Everyone present here is very much invited to participate in that reception. And if you're joining us online for this ceremony, please do celebrate at home, my suggestion would be. Um, and what we are still going to do here uh, in this room is to take the traditional photo of the young doctor together with his paronyms, together with his uh, supervisors, one of them online indeed, and together with the uh, uh, entire committee um, and the beadle. So my request is for everyone in the Ola to already go to the reception, except for the uh, family and friends present here on the first row. And I've already seen that we have a very good photographer present here who is going to take that, uh, uh, that photo. Congratulations again. And with that, I close this academic ceremony.